Yes, we're broadcasting from the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah. The coalition of Immokalee workers won a victory last week when Walmart, the world's largest retailer, signed on to an agreement to improve wages and working conditions for farm workers in its supply chain. About 30,000 workers will directly benefit from Walmart's decision to join its fair food program. Eleven other companies have joined the program, including Chipotle, McDonald's and Whole Foods. Well, today we turn to a new documentary focusing on the nation's best-known farm worker organizer, Cesar Chavez. In 1962, he founded the National Farm Workers Association, which would later become the United Farm Workers of America. He led the union for the next three decades and organized a series of historic strikes and boycotts. Here at the Sundance Film Festival, a new documentary has just premiered called Caesar's Last Fast. The film features never-before-seen footage of Chavez's 1988 36-day fast to bring attention to the dangers of pesticides in the fields. The film is directed by Richard Ray Pettis and Lorena Parley. This is an excerpt. His physical stamina is uh, rapidly deteriorating. I believe I am. We are getting to a critical point of his fast here. We're, we're all uh, of the opinion that, that we strongly urge Caesar to give serious consideration to discontinuing his fast. He was in so much pain. Towards the end, he couldn't talk very much. I remember people would come in to comfort him, right? He ended up comforting them. And they felt much better when they left, right? And so not only did he have to carry the burden of his own fast, right? But he had to uh, comfort folks that came to see him as well. That's an excerpt from Caesar's Last Fast. Director Richard Ray Pettis joins us here in Park City. His father was a farm worker who labored and lived in the conditions Cesar Chavez fought to improve. When Pettis was four years old, he and his family joined the great boycott and marched in the picket lines that Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers of America organized to pressure growers to sign labor contracts that guaranteed the humane treatment of California's grape pickers. Richard Ray Pettis, welcome to Democracy. Now. Uh, thank you, Amy. What a documentary. Yeah, um, uh, we've been getting a wonderful, wonderful response here at Sundance, and it's just um, it's such an honor to bring it to this platform and introduce and reintroduce Caesar's story to a new generation of Americans and, and ultimately a new generation of, of global citizens. So tell us a story. Tell us the story of Caesar's last fast. Well, um, in 1988, Caesar was 61 years old at the time, and um, the the uh, United Farm Workers uh, had been struggling to regain the victories that they had in the 60s and the 70s. And um, so they launched a third great boycott because the laws that were set up by Jerry Brown in California to protect farm workers and give them the right to um, collectively bargain weren't being enforced and they were struggling to, to, um, to sort of um, stay successful. At the same time, uh, cancer clusters emerged in Central California and Central Valley. Uh, farm workers, uh, farm worker women, were reporting unexplained miscarriages. Their children were born, being born with um, severe deformities and uh, a lot of cancer. Um, there were very, very high cancer rates. All the evidence pointed to the use of pesticides, which at the time, at the time were, were loosely regulated. So um, Caesar decided to uh, go on a fast to recommit himself to um, this third great boycott, and particularly around the, um, the unregulated use of pesticides in the fields and on farm workers. So uh, he told nobody in the first few days, and after a few days, his wife really sort of feared out what, what was going on. And at that point, um, people started to slowly rally around him, primarily the UFW workers and a few very close supporters came to um, where he was fasting at 40 acres, the UFW compound. And then describe what happened over those 36 days. Sure. So. Um 
at the time, his press secretary was a woman named Lorena Parley, and um, she was very close to Caesar. She had been working with him for a number of years, and she began videotaping as much as she could all the activity around this fast. Um, she had unprecedented access to, and very intimate access to Caesar in his fasting chamber, and the interactions he had with um, the UFW staffers, with family, with uh, doctors. And what she captured was um, some raw material that showed um, a visible decline in his health every day as the fast progressed. Um, so when I got the footage and started looking at it, it became very clear that there was a story around um, this fast where Caesar is getting weaker and weaker day by day. The family is getting more concerned. They come in and try to try to talk him into breaking the fast, and it doesn't work. Doctors come in a few days later and try to reason with him, and he doesn't decide. Uh, he decides to keep fasting. And ultimately, uh, Jesse Jackson, who had just finished um, a presidential campaign, came in at around day 34 and proposed to Caesar uh, this plan that uh, he and the other supporters around him, Dolores Huerta, Martin Sheen, would take on the fast, and they would fast for three days and pass it along. That way, Caesar's fast can continue among his supporters, and Caesar could then eat again and hopefully spare his health. And so describe those last days and uh, the footage that you have in this document. Sure. Um, Caesar um, is so weak um, that he is sort of slipping in and out of consciousness. Um, there are moments when he looks like he uh, very well could have passed away. Um, and in those moments, you sort of realize how how dedicated he is to this cause and essentially his willingness to die for the cause, but also the recklessness of it. Um, here's a man that was leading, uh, that had led this historic movement, and you start to wonder, could he have recklessly decided to give his life um, for this cause and at the same time sort of uh, threaten the efficacy of his movement at that time because of what could be seen as recklessness? But fortunately, um, he breaks his fast. and. During, uh, on day 36, he's so weak, um, his sons have to carry him into a mass. Um, they, there were 7,000 people who came to a mass where Caesar was to break his fast. They carry him in. They sit him next to his 96-year-old mother, who's in tears, and um, on one side. And on the other side is Ethel Kennedy, who's come to help him break the fast. Uh, her husband, Robert Kennedy, was at Caesar's side in 1968 when Caesar uh, um, broke his first fast. And at the right moment during the Mass, Caesar, um, or a priest, brings a piece of bread to Ethel Kennedy. She breaks off a piece, gives Caesar his first food in 36 days. His mother cries, and the cr crowd goes wild. So it's a heavily symbolic moment of breaking of the bread and, and a sort of a uh, um, taking of the host, if you will, um, for this just incredible act of sacrifice. Can you talk about the access that this film gives all of us, the access that well, in a sense, you're co-director of the film. She died in 2006. Yes. Uh, why she had it? Well, she had it. Um, she, uh, Lorena herself, was a filmmaker. This is Lorena Parley. Lorena Parley, uh, yes, the co my co-director was a, uh, herself was a, f a, uh, a filmmaker, and um, she had volunteered for the UFW, um, became Caesar's press secretary in, in exchange for someday being uh, allowed to make a film about Caesar. So she had it in her mind that she had this. Well, she saw the opportunity to record this historic footage. I, I think she saw it after it progressed, because she really started recording around day 23, and she recru recruited uh, a cameraman named Jim Chrysanthus, who we later connected with and shot a lot of our interviews uh, with. So um, this opportunity had never existed before. Um, Caesar was a very, very private man, although he had a very public life, and um, it was phenomenal that in this sort of setting that she was um, first courageous enough to turn on the cameras. And and at the same time, respectful enough not to sort of invade the, the this you know intensely personal act. Uh, so in that process, she captured this uh, phenomenal footage that when I started looking at it, I inherited the footage in 2007. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought, oh my God, is this really what I think it is? And how did you get involved? So. Um, 
My, as, as you mentioned uh, when you introduced the show, that my father had been a farm worker, and when I was a kid, my family were active in supporting the farm worker movement. Um, so years later, when I became a documentary filmmaker, I was interested in, in doing a documentary about um, Cesar Chavez. And so at one point, my mentor and, and colleague, Robert Greenwald, talked about it, and we, we could never sort of uh, work out our schedule, and, and it didn't happen. Then one day, I got a call from a woman who said, hi, I'm Lorena Parlee. Um, I heard you're interested in doing a documentary filmmaker. I'm already working on a project. And um, I had heard that somebody was working on a project, and I was, at that point, I was thinking of, of just letting it go. So she tells me that, um, you know, her history, she had been, you know, she's just press secretary. She had been working on the project at that point for 10 years. She had amassed 85 hours of footage, including this footage that had never been, never been seen before of the fast. She also had this very intimate footage of Caesar's family's private burial service, and the rosary, and Caesar lying in state, and the grandchildren helping cover the coffin with dirt and Caesar's brother uh, building Caesar's coffin. It was all a, an incredible trove of footage. And she said she uh, had been struggling to finish the film um, and was looking for a collaborator. And she asked me if I was available to help her out as a producer. At that point, I had produced a number of projects. And I said, I'd love to help her. I'd love to help you. Um, but I just signed on to, for, uh, to direct a series, and I wasn't available for six months. So I said, so, Lorena, in six months, you know, I'll jump on the project. We'll get it going. And she said, well, I need somebody to help me now, because I'm being treated for breast cancer. And I could only work on the project for two weeks out of the month. So clearly, I was startled and moved. And during our conversation, there was a, a real sense of trust and, and, and just bonding. So I told Lorraine, I said, in six months, if you haven't found somebody, just let me know. I'll work on this project. You don't need to pay me. I'm really uh, committed to this cause. Six months come, uh, passes, and I didn't hear from her. I assume she found somebody else. Nine months later, I get a phone call from uh, an elderly gentleman, and he says, hi, I'm Lorraine Parley's stepfather. Lorraine died last month of breast cancer, and she left your name in her notes for us to contact you to see if you have finished her film. Do you want to finish her film? So at that point, it became a tremendous responsibility, not only for my family's history, but for Lorena's legacy. Lorena had committed her life to this cause. She was a wonderful human being. I can tell by everything that she left behind. So I embarked on a mission to ensure the completion of this film. And so you tell the story, though, not only of this last fast of Cesar Chavez, but of C Cesar Chavez through his life. I wanted to turn for a moment to Cesar Chavez in his own words, speaking at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco in November of 1984, a few months after he'd launched the third and longest great boycott. Today, thousands of farm workers live under savage conditions beneath trees and amid garbage and human excrement near tomato fields in San Diego County. Tomato fields which use the most modern farm technology. Vicious rats gnaw at them as they sleep. They walk miles to buy food at inflated prices, and they carry in water from irrigation ditches. Child labor is still common in many farm areas. As much as 30 percent of Northern California's garlic harvesters are underage children. Kids as young as six years old have voted in state, conducted union elections since they qualified as workers. Some 800,000 underage children work with their families harvesting crops across America. All my life, I have been driven by one dream, one goal, one vision to overthrow a farm labor system in this nation that treats farm workers as if they were not important human beings. Farm workers are not agricultural implements. They are not beasts of burden to be used and discarded. 1984. Our guest is Richard Ray Perez, who has just uh, produced a documentary, Caesar's Last Fast. So tell us. When, as Cesar Chavez says, all my life I have been driven by one dream, one goal, one vision. 
Tell us about Cesar Chavez and how he came to co-found the United Farm Workers. Sure. In his uh, in his formative years, when Cesar was a child, he was forced to work in the farm uh, in the fields of California after his family had lost their uh, their plot of land. So he knew um, uh, from direct experience what it was like to live and work as a farm worker, as a migrant farm worker in the Depression era. He had these direct experiences that just were etched in his soul, and they were very painful experiences. That those experiences really fueled um, his work for his entire life. I think Caesar was an incredibly empathetic person. Um, those memories could not escape him, and at the same time, rather than being angry or, or uh, being self-destructive, they fueled him to try to change something. He ultimately learned community organizing in urban areas, but that farm worker um, condition never left him. So he applied the community organizing skills um, to um, communities, in communities of, in the Central Valley, to organize farm workers. And talk about what was unique about his organizing model. Sure. Um, well, some, in some ways, there was, his organizing model was based uh, on uh, the organizing model of Sal Alinsky, which was passed on to Caesar's mentor, Fred Ross. Um, and Fred then trained uh, not only Caesar, but um, Dolores Huerta. What was different about Caesar's model, once he embraced it, his, he really brought in the sort of the cultural components of it. And he sought to organize not only the workers, but their families. Um, and his organizing often involved faith and prayer. Um, the Filipinos and, uh, farm workers and the Mexican-American, Chicano, and Mexican farm workers were Catholics primarily. And Caesar had a deep, deep faith that was passed along to him by his grandmother and his mother. And he used that faith to fuel um, the inspiration the farm workers needed to keep going, to believe that they can organize and make their life Richard, better. Richard, you talked about learning about the great uh, boycott when you were four years old. Yeah. So, 1969, I was in Head Start in my hometown of San Fernando, California. And um, at that time, it was just wonderful politically active times. There were some students from what was then uh, San Fernando Valley State College would come and volunteer at this Head Start. It was sort of a community movement. And one day, we were sitting out, sitting around having our, our lunch that was part of the Head Start program. And des the dessert is this fruit cocktail, which is bits of fruit fruit swimming in heavy syrup that no, sh no child should eat. <laughs> And so I noticed, I was sitting down with my preschool classmates, and across from me is one of the college volunteers, and I noticed that when it came to eating his fruit cocktail, he started plucking the grapes out of that fruit cocktail. And I was really curious, and I asked him, ooh, how come you're plucking the grapes out of your fruit cocktail? And he points at his uh, grapes, and he said, well, you know, the people that own the grape fields, they treat the people who pick the grapes terribly. They pay them very little money, they make them live in shacks, they humiliate them. And if the people complain, they fire them. And I remember looking at my grapes, and all of a sudden they became very ugly. And I couldn't eat those grapes. So I started, I plucked them out of my fruit cocktail. And I noticed all the other preschoolers at the table, they were listening. And they looked down at the grapes, and they were pretty disgusted too. And all, pretty soon all the preschoolers at that table, and eventually the whole class, couldn't eat those grapes. And for the rest of the year, we couldn't eat those grapes. And through elementary school, we couldn't eat those grapes, because we got the story of what um, those grapes meant at that time to the p people picking those grapes. Richard, in your documentary, you were also critical of uh, Cesar Chavez and organizing the United Farm Workers and some strategies. Talk about that. Sure. Um, so, in 1975, there was a huge victory in California around a historic law called the um, California Agricultural Labor Relations Act that um, Caesar and the Union had negotiated with, with um, um, Governor uh, Jerry Brown. So, after that period, there was a real challenge for um, how to lead the union in victory. And a lot of very talented union members had very strong ideas. So the, um, there was some infighting around uh, turning the union into a more traditional labor union with locals and uh, professionalizing the union. At that point, all union members and staffers, rather, were volunteers. And Caesar wanted to maintain the sort of a more sense of community and and, um, and community around sacrifice um, and building this even a residential community that caused a big rifts in the in the um, the union and I think there was a um, 
sort of, a, I would call it a power struggle. And I think Caesar had difficult, difficulty managing and leading that, that, the Union in that victory period. And as the infighting became very destructive, and a lot of animosity emerged between some of the very talented Union organizers who had helped build the Union and Caesar. And ultimately, it cost the Union its effectiveness and its ability to really um, lead in the past as, as it had. And um, the Union eventually membership started to decline. Well, Richard A. Perez, it's a remarkable documentary, and the footage you have of that last fast, um, uh, everybody should see. Richard Ray Perez is director of Caesar's Last Fast, also works as a producer in the documentary program here at the Sundance Institute. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we cover another movement, the civil rights movement. We cover Freedom Summer with Stanley Nelson. Stay with us. Thank you.